Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video course about matrices, vector spaces, linear equations and so on. And now in today's part 35 we will talk about the important rank nullity theorem. In some general sense this will tell us that linear maps conserve dimensions. What this exactly means we will discuss soon but first I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady via PayPal or by other means. And no matter which support possibility you choose, you always get access to the PDF versions and quizzes for all the videos. Now, before we can discuss and prove the rank nullity theorem, I would say we first should define the notions rank and nullity. Therefore, this video here starts with a plain definition. And as often we start with a general matrix A, which can be of rectangular form. And now for this matrix we can define a natural number called the rank of A. So in order to define this number we need something we have defined in the last video, namely the range of the matrix A. There, please recall, range of A describes the set of all the elements we hit with the map FA. So in this picture here, it's a subspace that lives here on the right hand side. And as a subspace, it has a well defined dimension. So in fact, this dimension is exactly what we call the rank of the matrix A. Hence, you can remember, rank of A describes the dimension of the space the columns of the matrix A can span. So there you see, it's not a complicated notion, it's just a non-negative integer. Indeed, the minimal value we could have here is 0 and the maximum value is also not hard to see. So maybe first note, because we have only n columns, it cannot be bigger than n. However, in addition, we also know that the range of A lies in Rm. Therefore, the highest dimension we can find in Rm would be m. In other words, the rank of A also has to be less or equal than m. Hence the result is rank of A lies between 0 and the minimum of n and m. Moreover, this explains now that we say a matrix A has full rank if the rank is exactly this minimum here. So in this case it's either n or m depending which number is smaller. So now you also know the term full rank. Indeed, this is a notion you often see while discussing ranks of matrices. Now, before we continue with more definitions, let's first look at some examples here. So let's start here with a very simple example. So this here is a matrix with just one row and we immediately see the rank is 1. Of course, the columns can only span a one dimensional vector space here. Hence, in this context here, we can also state that this matrix has full rank. Ok, then maybe another example might be more interesting. Now let's take a 2 times 3 matrix. Therefore, we can conclude that the maximum number the rank can have is now 2. In fact, we already see that the first two columns here already span a two-dimensional subspace in R2. Or in other words, they span the whole R2 already. So the third column is not needed for seeing that the rank is 2. So we conclude also here we have a matrix of full rank. Again, essentially you just have to see that the first two vectors here are linearly independent. And now I can tell you, in this example we already see the rank nullity theorem in work. And maybe to motivate it, let's draw a sketch to see what the matrix A does. So first we know it maps R3 into R2. Or saying it more precisely, this is what the map FA does. So now we know the rank is 2, which means we hit everything here on the right hand side. So the range of FA or of A is the whole R2. However, now if you look at the right hand side, you see, there we have one dimension more. In particular, here we can look at a very special direction, namely the direction given by the vector 1, 1, 1. So let's apply it to our matrix A to see what the outcome is. Of course, this is not a hard calculation. We have column 1 plus column 2 
plus column 3. And there you see, this gives us exactly the zero vector. Hence, what you should see now is that this subspace on the left hand side is exactly the kernel of the matrix A. Moreover, it has exactly dimension 1. And with this, we already see the rank nullity theorem here. The dimension on the left hand side plus the dimension on the right hand side is exactly the dimension we put in. So in this case, 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. Okay, with this we are now able to formulate the theorem. However, before we do that, maybe we first define the notion nullity as well. As you might have already guessed, this is just the name for the dimension on the left hand side. In other words, the dimension of the kernel of the given matrix A. So you see, it's not complicated at all, it's called nullity because it's about the space that is sent to zero. Moreover, please note, the nullity is a non-negative integer between 0 and n. Okay, with this you now know these two terms here, which explain the name of our theorem. However, I can also tell you that some people omit the term nullity in the name of the theorem altogether. It makes sense, because rank of a matrix is usually a term which is used more often than nullity. But of course, not the name, but the statement of the theorem is important for us. And indeed, it's a very general statement, because it holds for every matrix A or for every linear map. Now, important for the theorem here is that we know the number of the columns of the matrix. So the number n stands for the number of columns, which means the dimension we put in here on the left hand side is n. And now the claim of the rank nullity theorem is that this dimension is in some sense conserved. So for example here, if we map this R3 into something that is only two dimensional, we lose one dimension. And now the thing is, what we lose, we have to find in the kernel of A. So in this example here, we have a one dimensional subspace that has to collapse to the origin. Okay, and now we can put this into a general formula. So we add two dimensions. So we add the nullity and the rank of the matrix. So we have the dimension of the kernel on the left hand side and the dimension of the range on the right hand side. And together they have to be equal to the dimension we put in on the left hand side. So in the matrix picture, this is the number of columns we have. Okay, and this is now the whole rank nullity theorem. It tells you if you have one dimension, you can easily calculate the other one. So you see, this is a very important fact and we will use this a lot in linear algebra. And therefore, I think you are also interested in a proof of it. In fact, this is not so hard because we already know a lot about dimensions. Okay, let's start by introducing a variable for the nullity of the matrix A. So for the dimension of the kernel of A. And you know, a proper name for an integer could be k. And now we can conclude, if we choose a basis of the kernel, it has exactly k elements. So we can simply call them b1 to bk. And please note here, it can definitely happen that k is 0, which means we would choose the empty set for a basis of the kernel. Okay, and now we can use a fact from part 26, Steinitz exchange lemma. It tells us that we can extend the given basis to a basis of the whole Rn. So we add n minus k vectors we call Ci. And in order to make the whole thing a little bit nicer, let's numerate them from C1 to Cr. Hence lowercase r simply stands for n minus k. Okay, there you see, with Steinitz exchange lemma, we get a basis with n vectors, so a basis of Rn. Essentially, the idea here is very simple. We have some directions in Rn, and we just add the missing ones. Moreover, also please note here, it can definitely happen that R is equal to 0, which means we don't have to add anything. However, in all the other cases, we have to do a little bit more. Indeed, what we need to show now is that the dimension of the range of A is equal to our R here. 
because then we can conclude from r plus k is equal to n our rank nullity theorem. Therefore, the work we have to do now is to see what the range of a is. Now, to get the full range of a, we just have to apply the matrix to a basis of rn. Therefore, we just take our basis here from above. So you see, we have a times the vectors, and then we look at the span of these outcomes. At this point, we can use the information that b1 to bk lies in the kernel of a. Hence, all the first k entries here are represented by the zero vector. In other words, in the span, we can simply omit it. So you see, in the span here, we only have r vectors, which means the dimension of this span is definitely less or equal than r. And with this conclusion, we have shown the first part of the proof. So please recall, we want to show that this dimension is exactly r. And now you see, we have already one inequality here. Now, in order to show the equality here, we now have to prove that these vectors here are linearly independent. So let's write that down and then we do it. So this is our next step here. We show that this family is linearly independent. And in order to show that, as always, we have to choose an arbitrary linear combination for the zero vector. And then we just have to show that all our coefficients lambda here are actually zero. Now, for the first step, we look at the left hand side and then we see we can easily use the linearity or the properties of the matrix vector multiplication. So roughly said, we pull in the scalars and the addition signs. Hence, in the end, we have the matrix A times the linear combinations of vectors. And of course, these vectors are lambda i c i, where i goes from 1 to r. And now you see, we can immediately conclude that this new vector here is sent to the zero vector by the matrix A or by the map FA. Hence, this vector here lies in the kernel of A. So we write, this here is an element in the kernel of A. However, now please recall, for the kernel we already have a basis chosen as b1 to bk. Hence, we can also write this vector as a linear combination with this basis. And of course, for this we have to choose different names for the scalars. So let's call them mu j and j goes from 1 to k. Okay, now in the next step we can simply put the one linear combination to the other side. So essentially this means we only have one linear combination on the left hand side. And on the right hand side we find the zero vector. And at this point you should recall that the vector c together with the vectors b form a basis of the whole Rn. In other words, now we can use the linear independence of this basis. Hence, this means a linear combination for the zero vector is only possible with vanishing coefficients. In particular, we can conclude that all the lambda factors here are actually zero. And indeed, this is exactly what we wanted to show. Because with this result, we see only the trivial linear combination here is possible, which means that this family is indeed linearly independent. And with this result, we can conclude that the dimension of the range of A is indeed exactly R. In other words, the rank of the matrix A is R and the rank nullity theorem is proven. Okay, as I said before, please remember this important theorem, we will use it a lot. So for example, in the next video, when we talk about solving systems of linear equations, we will need it a lot. Therefore, I would say, let's be there and have a nice day. Bye.